M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 165 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. I'm your host, Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. And if the Supreme Court hasn't intervened, Pete Navarro is spending his first full day in prison. Oh, congrats, Pete. Yeah, first day of the rest of the next several months. We'll talk about that along with an update in Fulton County that includes the resignation of Nathan Wade and the dismissal of six of the felony counts. We also have a delay in the Manhattan DA's election interference case with an upcoming hearing on why SDNY provided late discovery to Trump pursuant to a subpoena. Ah, the Sovereign District of New York, uh, as they call it, which is actually the Southern District of New York. Um, Yeah, we're going to look over all of that. And um, I think, you know, we just canceled our trips uh, that we were making to New York (laughs) on on April 1st to, to witness some of that trial. Uh, in the Manhattan DA's case. But today we're also going to talk Trump world money problems, including Mm. Trump being turned down by 30 companies to secure a bond, including the Chubb Group and the New York Attorney General's civil fraud $364 million judgment. And Rudy Giuliani, who is being asked to sell one of his Florida properties to help pay Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. Well, all of his creditors, actually, in the bankruptcy court. Uh, along with an update on Jeffrey Clark's disbarment proceeding. God, it's, how long does it take to disbar somebody? It so obviously needs to be disbarred. Too long. But first, we need to thank some new patrons. Patrons, you make this show go. Thank you so much. And by the way, if you're a patron of this program, you will get pre-sale and access to the me tour, the Daily Beans tour. So <laughs> you can come out and see me. <laughs> uh, thank you for being patrons. Sarah Frazier, Dee Digby, Drew Jennings, Jessica Myers, Giselle Dubson, Ruth M., and Sweet Cheeks Laboingi. Great name. Thank you very much. (laughs) For all those pre-sale VIP meet and greet ticket needs, you can go to allisongill.com or dailybeanspod.com. Click on tour. Um, Pete, let's start with the most humiliating court filing that Trump has ever had to submit in his life. It basically says, I'm broke. I have no friends. Nobody loves me. Companies won't lend to me. He has notified the court that he does not have the money. This is the New York Attorney General civil fraud trial. Doesn't have the money or the property to secure a bond in that civil fraud disgorgement. And here's a a little uh, taste from the filing. In deciding whether to enter a stay, the court may consider any relevant factor, including the presumptive merits of the appeal and any exigency or hardship confronting any party. Here, Trump's ongoing diligent efforts have proven that a bond in the judgment's full amount is a practical impossibility. And I'm going to break in here, Pete. He's acting like it would be practically impossible for anyone. Uh, no, it's just, <laughs> it's just practically impossible for him and his circumstances. Trump goes on to say, these diligent efforts have included approaching about 30 surety companies through four separate Oof. brokers. Oof. Huh. The court should stay the judgment pending appeal and put the brakes on the attorney general's overzealous litigation crusade. If oral argument would assist the court in coming to that conclusion, we respectfully request a hearing. OK, so he's basically saying that, judge, uh, you can also consider other relevant factors here, including the merits of the case. And what he then does is goes on to argue that he would be successful on the merits on appeal 
because the court undervalued his properties, like Mar-a-Lago. He says that the court said it was worth between 18 and 26 million when it's actually worth $1.2 billion. And this is hilarious because if that were true, he'd probably be able to come up with a bond. So (laughs) his inability to get a bond from 30 plus companies or or lenders, uh, other lenders, we don't know if he's tried to get uh, any loans because, you know, a a judge did put an interim stay on his uh, inability to go and out and ask for loans from banks uh, certified by New York. But if he were able, if he, if it, if it were worth one point two billion, uh, he he'd be able to uh, to put up assets for this bond. Yeah, you would think. Last time I checked, one point two billion dollars is more than five hundred million dollars. And hey, you know the other thing, his his son in law, uh, Jared, apparently has plans to invest five hundred million dollars in a uh, Belgrade. Development, so yeah, that seems to me would cover it. But I'm sure that's not where his Saudi sugar daddies want him putting um, that investment money. But I look, it's ridiculous. It's a shell game. Trump doesn't have the money. It's clear he doesn't have the money. It's clear that all these places, when he is going thirty, thirty no thank yous, one after the other, uh, essentially not wanting to do this. And what Trump does have is, you know, any complaint about well, if I have to sell it, I would have to sell it at a loss and so unfair, so unfair. Well, then don't do the crime. I, well, yeah. Is just, I, it, it, it's, and you can still appeal it, but you've got to come up with some sort of, you know, ability to guarantee this or, mm-hmm. you know, be prepared yeah, to mean, have some of your appe- property seized. He can appeal, but, Starting March 25th, without this bond in place, they can start seizing assets. And the New York Attorney General has said that that she intends to do that. I imagine 40 Wall Street will be the first to go. But, you know, we'll see what ends up happening here because that's less than a week away. Now, New York Attorney General filed opposition to his stay request without bond in an earlier filing saying Trump never demonstrated he had enough liquid assets to satisfy the judgment and he has substantial liabilities, such as E. Jean Carroll's cases. <laughs> Moreover, <laughs> there's a significant risk that absent a full bond or deposit, Trump will attempt to evade enforcement of the judgment or to make enforcement more difficult after an appeal. Absent a full bond or deposit, the Office of the Attorney General would be highly prejudiced and likely to uh, forced to expend substantial public resources to execute the judgment if it is affirmed on appeal, which I think it probably will be. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, let me let me put on our fortune teller hats right now, <laughs> and I will guarantee you the attorney general is going to be forced to expend substantial public resources to execute the judgment once it is affirmed on appeal. I, I cannot envision a scenario where that doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, I think so too. And again, Trump has till March 25th to post this bond. So I I wanted to get back to talking about how humiliating this is for Donald Trump, this filing. It stands out to me as probably the most uh, humiliating filing that he's had to make on a public docket to date. And I can't imagine he was happy to have to tell the public that he can't get anybody to back up this bond. Do you know what I mean? I mean, this is like his soul, his business, his this is the thing that matters the most to to him. I don't think he cares about breaking the law or going to prison or the, that Weisselberg had to go to prison for lying for him uh, or well, he's been charged with perjury now, but he's pled guilty, but he had to go to prison for his fraud. Uh anyway, I I just find that this is probably the thing that bothers him the most in the world right now. Yeah, well, it's going to bother him a lot more when he has to give up some of these properties. I, I, he, so a couple of points. One, I, it is bad for him. I, I know everybody, and we'll talk about just all the little delays on the criminal side. And you know, folks, as we've said a hundred times, the criminal justice system is not the speediest thing if people are looking for quick justice. But we, regardless of whether or not the man goes to jail, and I think he will eventually end up there, the fact of the matter is his ego and his money – The two things he cares the most about are so much at play right now. And I cannot envision this scenario. And we've talked time and time again. It's been proven out. He he is not liquid. He does not have liquid assets. I'm surprised he was able to cover Eugene's uh, bond. And thank goodness he did, because I'm glad she is going to see that money. 
But when it comes to the state of New York, I don't see any way he gets any. And that's why, you know, 30 different companies telling him no. And at the end of the day, you know, the the insurance industry, the reinsurance industry is amongst the most cautious of any sort of financial market that you're going to find. They are not speculators. They are not venture capitalists. They want safety. And what you see in the filing from his attorneys, time and time again, people saying these reinsurance companies uh, bond potential bond uh, issuers. We don't want real estate. We need things that are liquid. If you have stock, if you have sort of monetary instruments, that's fine. But we're not going to go and do some intangible. You know, we don't want your plane. We don't want your real estate. Yeah, I heard an expert who works in bonding say that if you're going to put property up, it's got to be like three or four times the value of the bond in order for us to accept right. it as as collateral. And and Trump has made his life on – it's not that he holds all these things sort of mortgage-free. I mean, he has played the game of just refinancing and refinancing and refinancing. So it's not as if he has huge, deep reservoirs, despite what he says about, I have so much money, I can do with that, whatever I want. He doesn't. And this is going to prove it. And I think, you know, if push comes to shove, what's going to be very interesting, if he has to sell off a property, to see what sort of liens are on there. And I mean, those are, there won't be public records out there about that. So I'm hopeful that somebody between, you know, the financial folks at the New York Times or elsewhere will talk about what encumbrances are already on those properties. But talk about his ego. I mean, it's one thing to sit there and say, I can't get anybody to give me a bond. But if he has to sell a Manhattan property or a golf course somewhere, and he, I don't, looking at the revenue, like, and again, I don't understand, and there has been this perpetual question, particularly with regard to, what is it, uh, Troon over in Scotland, his golf course, is a perpetual money, money sinkholes. It's a money So pit. much so that people are wondering, is this like a front for money laundering? There, <laughs> There is no financial reason that this should have been there for so long. Is there some alternative explanation of shenanigans? And I don't know if he wanted to sell that, if he wanted to sell his little Trump International golf course here in the Potomac. I don't think he could get anywhere near what he needs. So the prospect of having to sell multiple properties, let's go. Yeah. And a lot of them are just licensed in his name, like he doesn't actually own the properties. Uh, and one of the aspects of the 2020 election that I talked about all the time was that in 2024, which is now, a lot of loans were going to be coming due for Donald Trump, probably between a half a billion and a billion dollars worth of loans were going to be coming due, and that that was a national security problem. Uh, because if you owe money to, you know, if you owe tons and tons of money um, and we don't know who you owe it to, that's a problem. Um, take case in point, Manafort, um, <laughs> who is now is being considered to be brought back on the Trump campaign, by the way. And we can talk. We, I want to talk to you about that on the bonus episode this weekend. No, um, I'll need a lot to drink before I go there. I just I'm so livid. <laughs> yes, we, well, it. it's I, like, well, I hear constant Klimnik's available too, so I'm not bring them back on two for one, <laughs> and they can like you know, rust yeah. up some money from MBS or you know Erdogan or CC or somebody. I'm sure that's. I figured there'd be a lot of swearing, which is why I wanted to put it on the bonus yeah, for patrons this week. Yeah. Um, but you know, just a lot of those. Th th this is a national security issue at this point. We don't even know who's backing the $91 million bond. If it's China, if it's Elon Musk, like it's important, I think, to understand who our presidential candidates are indebted to, especially for those amounts. I mean, w it was bad enough that Manafort owed $14 million to Oleg Deripaska. Um, and that was just $14 million. We're talking, you know, more than half a billion dollars here. So, Anyway, um, just a national security threat, something to think about as well. But uh, this is, I think, extremely – I mean, if there's a day at which the walls at Mar-a-Lago would be covered with the most ketchup, if there's like a, if there's like a, a Richter scale for ketchup you know, uh, down at Mar-a-Lago, this would be up there as the biggest day. Yeah, and I think – I don't know that we're there yet. I mean, this is definitely bad, but I think bad is going to come when the judicial system in New York says no – you either have to pay this money or provide a bond. And that is that. There is not some alternative where you can, you know, give 10% of this and keep having access to all these New York banks. No, the answer is no, full stop. And whenever that comes, and I don't think it will take that long, that's the day that the, the walls will run red with ketchup. 
the walls will smile. Yeah, down. it'll be like the uh, the Overlook Hotel, right? But with ketchup. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, March 25th is that drop dead date. I think we might hear something from the judge in this case uh, prior to that. But we'll see and we'll let you know on this show. All right. We have more news about the date, March 25th, but we have to take a quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. We have more patrons to thank. Diana Solomon, Tina Burns Cardi, Stacy A, Wendy Livingston, Suzanne Frock, Robin Brown, and WTF dude. Yeah, that's that's about that's about right. So thank all of you. Thank you so much for making this show possible for letting us get this news to you in the bonus episode every week. You're just key members of the team and can't thank you enough for your support. So Yeah, and I I think it's kismet that the last patron in this section is WTF dude because I just wrote a post on post called WTF SDNY. So (laughs) Yeah. Perfect segue. Perfect segue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we met right before the break we talked about that Trump has until March the twenty fifth to cough up the bond in the New York Attorney General Civil Fraud case. Well there's also something else that's going on and important about March twenty fifth. That was supposed to be when the Manhattan District Attorney's election interference trial was supposed to begin. But no Instead of jury selection, there's going to be a hearing about why SDNY, which again is the Southern District of New York, DOJ's uh, prosecutors, there's two in New York City, one is the Eastern District of New York, the other is SDNY. And anyway, there's going to be a hearing about why SDNY produced discovery last week, not Mm -hmm. earlier, just, you know, days ago. As a result, Trump has filed a motion to dismiss the entire case in the New York State District Attorney's Office, or the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, based on discovery violations. Now, here's what happened. It's best we know from open source reporting. Over a year ago, and this is from uh, District Attorney filings, over a year ago, the District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, asked SDNY for all of the grand jury materials for the Michael Cohen campaign finance case. Now, remember, Cohen went to prison for this, and Trump was referred to as individual one in that case. And there was a lot of drama between SDNY. This is from uh, Jeffrey Berman's book that Maine Justice called, and there were a lot of references to Trump, and they wanted uh, SDNY. They wanted to this remove them. They wanted right. to remove them entirely. Bill Barr saying, get rid of all of them. And then, you know, SDNY said, we're not. We're going to, you know, leave in some critical ones. But the point being, they did remove some. They toned down the indictment to minimize the exposure of what Donald Trump was in there having done. Thank you, Bill Barr, for your never-ending efforts to uh, suborn justice. Now, SDNY, in response to this Alvin Bragg uh, subpoena, or request rather, SDNY produced a subset of the documents. They said, hey, DA, we're not, Alvin, we're not going to give you all of these. We're going to give you some of them. And then once the district attorney got that, they turned them over to the Trump team during discovery in the DA's case last year, last June. Now, this January, three months ago, Trump subpoenaed SDNY for documents on his own as part of his defense. And then after several agreed upon delays, and I'll come back to that because that really sticks in my craw. After several (laughs) agreed upon delays, they started, they being SDNY, started making productions last week right? On the eve of trial, which is supposed supposed to have begun on March 25th. Now, the first production on March 4th included, Allison, get this, not one, not a hundred, not even a thousand, 73,000 pages. Now, the district attorney's office went through and said, hey, of that, that's a big number, but look, only about 172 of those were related to the case, but they weren't part of what the DA asked for over a year ago. And then it gets a little confusing. Then SDNY turns around and they provide a second production, this time 31,000 pages. So now we're up to over 100,000 pages. Now, the second production includes a subset which are relevant to the case and were part of what the DA asked for over a year ago. But when the DA, when Alvin Bragg asked for them last year, SDNY either wouldn't or couldn't hand them over. And then finally, there's a third production of about 15,000 pages that are likely unrelated to the case and we're also not part of what the DA asked for over a year ago, but we have yet to see what's in there. So stepping back, only a subset of the second production of the 31,000 pages is related to the case. And that was withheld from the district attorney a year ago after he asked for them 
were, were given to Trump last week. Now, the little bit of like what, what bothers me about this is that it wasn't just that Alvin Bragg went to SDNY and said, hey, can you give me all the stuff? And SDNY turned around and said, nope, we're going to give you a little bit, but not the rest of this, and then turn around and give some of the rest of this to Donald Trump when he asked again. In the course, remember, in January, Donald Trump's team asked SDNY for this information three months ago. SDNY, multiple times, we don't know how many, but more than once, went back to Trump and said, hey, we need a little more time. Can we get a little more time to turn this over to you? Guess what Trump's attorneys are saying? Yeah, of course. Take all the time you need. They're probably calling him saying, hey, you sure you don't want another extension? We're happy to give you an extension. So even if there's a legitimate explanation of why SDNY couldn't provide this information, I don't understand how once they got that request, they're turning around, we're given a deadline, and we're asking for an extension from Donald Trump to have more time. Of course, Trump's going to say yes. Especially without contacting the district attorney's office to let them know there are additional new documents coming their way. Uh, That I also uh, don't quite understand uh, either. And, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation about what these documents could be or why they were withheld. But, you know, like you said, to give Trump a bunch of extra time or to ask Trump if they can have extra time without contacting the district attorney's office is is weird. And I think that that is something that will come out in this hearing, because I'm going to talk about that in a second, because the judge is asking for all emails and communications with the Southern District of New York, because maybe Southern District of New York did reach out to the D.A., um, we just we don't know, but I think that we will get a lot of those answers, but probably not all of them. So Trump has said that this late production amounts to discovery violations. You've trampled all over my face. And he's asking the court to dismiss the entire case. Now, the judge has adjourned the case until April 15th. So it's it's on the calendar, but it's kind of up in the air that date. And he's set a hearing for March 25th, as we said. He's asked both sides to produce all their documents, communications with the Southern District of New York, DOJ, so he can determine who is to blame for the late production. Now, I doubt personally that the DA is at fault here. I think the DA last June gave Trump everything they had. And as you know, discovery is limited to stuff that the prosecutors have. You can't produce stuff that you don't have access to. And for whatever reason, whatever SDNY didn't turn over to them, they would be unable to produce. Uh, So there's that, right? Um, But that, again, doesn't answer why the Southern District withheld documents a year ago that they were willing to hand over last week. Why? Why are these documents, were they not handed over then? What happened between now and then that made them handable overable? You know, like like how has the disposition of these documents changed and why in that time period over the last uh, little bit over a year? And again, the judge has said he'll rule on Trump's motion to dismiss the entire case after the March 25th hearing, which he has limited to be just about this Southern District of New York document production. And he will set a new trial date in that ruling that will come after the hearing if he does not dismiss the case. But he did say, don't make any plans for the next couple of months in case this trial goes forward. Now, I know a lot of people were freaked out where he said, I'm going to set a new trial date if necessary. But he has to say that. Because he can't give any indication of whether or how he's going to rule on this motion to dismiss the case until he has the hearing and makes the ruling. So he has to say, all right, I'll have a hearing. I'll listen to your arguments about why you want to dismiss the case. And government, I'll listen to your arguments about why it shouldn't be dismissed. Show me all the emails between you and Southern District of New York so I can determine that this isn't the DA's fault, at least, and and, and then set a trial date. But he has to, he can't say, I'll probably set a trial date after that because that'll show that he's already made a decision or he's leaning one way without listening to all the facts. So he has to say, if there's still a trial going forward, we'll set that trial date. Um, so I, but I don't want everybody to kind of read into that too deeply because, like I said, he also said, also don't make any plans for a couple months, as we said before, because this is, you know, if I do set a trial date, you're going to be busy. Yeah. And look, I don't think he's going to dismiss the case. The district attorney was very explicit in their filing about exactly what they had turned over and the dates they turned it over. So I think I would be very surprised if there's any sort of discovery violation on the part of the district attorney. And consequently, I don't think they're going to be sanctions as severe as dismissing the case. I can see the the judge saying, well, you know, granted, 
90% of this, tens of thousands of documents are not at all relevant, but you do have a right to go through it and review it. And remember too, you know, Donald Trump's attorneys have also already raised this point. Passover begins, I think it's like the, uh, the April, April 22nd, 22nd <laughs> or so. And they said, hey, look, we don't want anybody who happens to be an observant Jew in New York City, potentially on the jury, not being able to attend. So it would not surprise me at all if, that, I mean, that's a Again, it, the purpose is delay, but that's a legitimate request, and I can see the judge taking that into account, which means, again, I would be very surprised to see these counts dismissed, but I would not at all be surprised for him to set a trial date, meaning jury selection, beginning in May after 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 the passover observance is done and uh, you know so then we're talking you know may june and then how that trickles out to everything going on down at mar-a-lago and you know down at fulton county whatever happens there and we're going to talk about that in a little bit but it just it is i i have never seen anybody with the luck of donald trump in <laughs> the uh, criminal justice system but yeah my uh, we'll my there, but it's not going to be smooth my my guess on the outcome is exactly that. I, I I think one, the judge will find the DA has met his discovery obligations, and two, he'll dismiss Trump's motions for discovery sanctions and to dismiss the case. Uh, I said number three, he will set a trial date depending on the number of relevant documents there are to review. I'd guess either April fifteenth or April twenty ninth, so as not to start in the middle of Easter or Passover. But here's my thing about the Southern District of New York. I think they're going to confirm that they handed over everything they could to the DA. Uh, or the DA will show that through the emails and, and production, and that any additional material was properly withheld at the time. Uh, and I, but here's here's what I think, because I mean, it could have been withheld for a lot of different reasons, right? The the hope is that it was withheld because there's open and ongoing investigations, but the, apparently the, the that would mean that they're not open and ongoing anymore, and could have been handed over. I think it's probably more likely, given Merrick Garland's timidity to give the Department of Justice a black eye. Pete, I think that maybe this is uh, they didn't want to hand anything over to show that Bill Barr had interfered so fiercely in the uh, prosecution of Michael Cohen um, uh, by removing the individual ones or a lot of the references to Donald Trump in that indictment. And I bet that they're going to claim deliberative process privilege to keep that hidden from us, uh, much like Merrick Garland wanted to do, but lost mostly. When uh, we were we were trying to get, uh, I think Judge Amy Berman Jackson was trying to get the Barr memo about the Mueller obstruction counts, right? Remember when Barr put out a memo saying that even if Trump wasn't a uh, sitting president, we still wouldn't uh, go for obstruction of justice. We wouldn't prosecute for obstruction of justice because you need to have an underlying crime to obstruct justice, which is just wrong on the law. But that was all kept hidden. And Merrick Garland continued to try to hide it using deliberative process privilege and uh, I think that was one of the, uh, by the way, one of the things that I was very vehemently against Merrick Garland doing. Uh, but I, I'm afraid that we'll see something kind of similar to that in this situation. They, d they don't want to give the DOJ a black eye. And so we're not going to find out why those things weren't handed over a year ago. But again, that is total speculation. It could, we could find out that everything was handed over and Trump is lying. Uh, and he's just trying to delay and get a dismissal on discovery problems. I mean, it's obvious to me he filed this late discovery subpoena in January uh, so that he could come back and make the argument that I need more time, I need to delay, so that he could push this trial into the other trials in an attempt to delay them all. But I'm very interested to see what Southern District of New York has to say. Yeah, and there are a bunch of questions there. Uh, you know, one is what changed? Uh, it, was it the thing that there are different standards? One, if a criminal defendant is subpoenaing documents, that is a different standard than if a uh, city prosecutor is asking for them. Or two, oh. did something change? You know, at the time that the DA asked for them, uh, they couldn't provide it, but something changed legally such that they are now able to provide it. There's another question about like, how did Trump know to subpoena it? Is that just like a pro forma? Yeah, of course, he's going to subpoena SDNY. Or was there some information from Bill Barr, somebody Barr adjacent, that maybe there kind of is something that would be interesting or useful to you and you should ask for it? Like why? You know, they didn't have to subpoena them at all. I mean, it's smart luring. And did they wait just because they knew yeah, they could prolong that's as what much I as think. possible? That's what I but think. This is his first criminal case, right? I think we'll probably see this in other criminal cases. And everyone, if you're listening, 
be be ready for Donald Trump to make last minute subpoenas for documents that he that he didn't get from you in discovery so that he can come out and say that there's a discovery violation and file for a motion to dismiss at a late stage. I think that's that's just one of his delay uh, tactics and, and one of his uh, ways to try to get uh, proof that uh, he should have his uh, charges dismissed against him. This is just the first criminal trial. And I think that's why we saw it. <laughs> Yeah. And he's already, I mean, he's in full swing down at Mar-a-Lago, no question about it. But he, even in New York, like, look, there. if you hadn't heard, there's another uh, another filing recently. He just notified uh, Judge Murchon in New York. He intends to use an advice of counsel defense, except, <laughs> well, it's not exactly advice of counsel. He says it's, quote, not a formal, unquote, advice of counsel defense. So, as a result, like, and, and for those of you who are not attorneys or familiar with advice to counsel, one of the things you can, what you're essentially saying is, hey, to the extent I did anything wrong, I did it wrong because my attorney said it was okay. But if you're going to do that and you can claim that defense, you waive attorney client privilege because part of what you have to show is that, like, look, here's what my attorneys told me. Here's what I asked them. Here's our discussion back and forth. But Trump is trying, like Trump always does, to have his cake and eat it too, to say, I'm going to do this new thing I made up kind of called advice of counsel-ish. It's kind of like George <laughs> Santos saying he's Jew-ish, right? <laughs> advice of counsel-ish. It's not exactly, they told me to do it, but yet not so much that I need to waive anything. So you just have to take my word for it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to waive any of these uh, privileges between my, me and my uh, attorneys and the conversations we had, but it, it's nonsense. It isn't that is not going to go anywhere. I'm very comfortable that it's a a, a nonsense sort of mm. claim. But again, he he would know, also have to testify, filing away. Yeah, which is not gonna <laughs> not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. All right. Well, he has testified here and there um, to his detriment, um, but uh, yeah, that that made me laugh. Um, as as did his immunity claim uh, in this case. Right. Because uh, he, he wanted to delay this case based on presidential immunity. Um, and and uh, the judge came back and said, first of all, all that shit was due February 22nd, pal. Um, and second of all, I'm not going to wait for SCOTUS on immunity. Well, he didn't make a ruling. I don't think he's made a ruling yet. But, you know, um, you, you did those crimes uh, way before you were president, uh, allegedly, um, to be fair. Uh, but um, I, I think we talked about that on a previous episode. But uh, yeah, these these motions are never going to stop. And uh, just to save you all a bunch of pain, there are going to be more delays, not necessarily in this trial, just in general, in all of his in all of his trials. There's going to be a lot of stuff that comes out that you don't like. There's going to be objections of his that are sustained. There's going to be more charges maybe thrown out uh, in pretrial motions. There's going to be a lot of evidence that might not be allowed in that are granted in part in motions in limine from Trump. And there's going to be more, probably more delays. Uh, just be prepared for that. Like when you're going to the DMV and you know you're going to be there for six hours and it's going to suck, like bring a book. <laughs> um, just, <laughs> just be prepared. Everybody seems like when we get these, um, you know, these decisions, uh, everybody seems to th want to throw their hands up and say, fuck it, n nothing's ever going to happen to this guy. The whole system is, is sucks, burn it down. Uh, and I get the frustration, I really do. Uh, but there's going to be a lot more of it. So uh, buckle in, we'll tell you all about it on Clean Bono 45. We have to take another quick break, but we'll be back after this message. Stick around. Hey, everybody, welcome back. We have more new patrons to thank, including Big D at the kids' table, Katie Fitz, uh, Fitzner, excuse me, a double N Jen, Sonja, Sonjarina, Sonjarina, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Donna Trulson, Diana Whitcomb, and Jersey Girl Living in a Midwest World. Welcome. Uh, well, I live in California now, but that's where I'm from. All right, let's head down to Fulton County because you know, this was actually probably this was the huge news of the week that was number one uh, in my script until the, you know, <laughs> the stuff in Manhattan and the stuff in this, the New York Attorney General um, civil fraud trial happened. But we are um, we're waiting to see which standard Judge McAfee would apply to the question of disqualifying the district attorney, Fonnie Willis. Would he apply the legal conflict of interest standard, which is a high standard, or the appearance of impropriety standard, which is a lower standard? Well, he ended up applying a bit of both. I thought he would go with just the conflict of interest higher standard, but he, he went with a bit of both. He says, 
The case does not meet the conflict of interest standard, so the DA can stay, but it does have the appearance of impropriety. So either DA Fonnie Willis and her whole office or Nathan Wade would have to resign. So very shortly after that decision, Nathan Wade tendered his resignation and Fonnie Willis accepted it. And additionally, uh, Pete, Nathan Wade, and we texted about this, I think, he was scheduled to appear on Meet the Press on Sunday uh, with Kristen Welker on MSNBC. And then last minute, last minute canceled due to a family emergency. And uh, as I said on the Daily Beans, I want to say if there's a family emergency in his family, I do hope that his family is okay. Uh, but I do think that by family, he meant his legal team and they told him not to go on. But we don't know um, if there is truly a family emergency down there. I don't want to belittle um, that kind of a thing. But he ended up not going on Meet the Press. So I thought that that was kind of a significant um, reversal. Now, many are asking if Trump can appeal this ruling about Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. And he can. But as Anna Bauer points out on Twitter, it's not that easy. She says, Sato, who is Trump's lawyer, has 10 days from the date of McAfee's order to seek what's called a certificate of immediate review. The certificate, if granted, would allow Trump to appeal the disqualification order before trial. So he's basically asking for permission to appeal by putting in this certificate for immediate review. Then he has to appeal um, the disqualification order before the trial and likely cause a substantial delay in the case. It's up to Judge McAfee to decide whether to grant the certificate of immediate review to begin with. Even if he does grant the certificate, the Georgia Court of Appeals could still decline to hear the case. Uh, she says, what is the standard of granting a certificate of immediate review? The only guidance provided in OCGA 5634 suggests that the trial court should consider whether its order, quote, is of such importance to the case that immediate review should be had. That's all it says. And Anna points out that in a separate order last week, McAfee cited the lack of precedential authority as a reason why he would be inclined to grant a certificate of immediate review. And Judge Scott McAfee had written his order on Willis and Wade, by the way, early last week, according to NBC News, but because he had been receiving threats, he waited over a week to make it public in order to allow for proper security to be in place for him and his family, um, which is, I guess, just par for the course now when you're dealing with a Trump criminal case. Uh, but back to this certificate um, of immediate review, Pete, it just came in Monday as we record this that Trump has filed that certificate for immediate review. We don't have a decision yet on it from Judge McAfee as it was just filed, but we'll keep everybody posted. Yeah. And that last point you made, I don't think is getting nearly enough attention. Part of the reason this is delayed is because of threats of violence from Trump supporters. There is no hesitation if something is going to Eileen Cannon does not sit on decisions because she's lining up, uh, you know, physical security uh, personnel because she's worried if she uh, issues a ruling in Trump's favor that they're going to come after her. The reason that we didn't get this decision days earlier, possibly even a week earlier, is because Judge McAfee was worried about threats to him from Trump supporters when he said, no, case goes on. That that intimidation, I cannot think of any other defendant in the United States where if a judge was waiting to issue a ruling until they could get physical security for them and their family lined up, that would, that would go without some sort of sanction. But it's just par for the course. It's like, well, when I do this, I'm probably going to get a lot of physical threats and light actual threats and people showing up. So I need to line up security because that's Donnie Trump and his supporters. And he's gone down, you know, this weekend was uh, at an event saluting the January 6th choir, which he continues to call hostages, that he's going to pardon all of them. And we wonder why judges are delaying things so that they can line up uh, security for themselves and their family. That mm -hmm. And it's just... It's just like, oh, yeah, well, that's just the way it is. It's not. It shouldn't be the way it is. And the fact that probably I would guess a decent number of folks who are listening to us are hearing this for the first time, that that's why McAfee delayed his release, just goes to show like the mainstream media is just, oh, yeah, it is what it is. Oh, that's, that's Donnie Trump for you. No, it's not okay. 
and this should be a much bigger deal. But somehow, you know, we're still fixated on whether or not this, you know, they're going to be successful in removing Fonnie Willis or whether or not they're going to successfully challenge whether she should have any sort of bar discipline. And everybody's just going to whistle past the graveyard of yet another direct manifestation of Trump's threats of violence to those who do anything to hold him to account. And I, I, I don't I don't know what has to happen for people to and by people, I mean, ABC, NBC, CBS, New York Times, Washington Post, everybody who has a megaphone to talk about this, to highlight what a threat it is and how horrible it is. We have just all kind of like baked it into the cost of doing business at this point. I don't get it. Yeah. Well, I, I think the bloodbath comment got um, pretty sufficient coverage. I know ABC led with it on uh, ABC True. News and the whole uh, right wing noise machine uh, response that we're taking it out of context. And he was talking about the auto industry. Uh, the media mm. didn't uh, cave. They, I think they stood pretty firm. But of course, it, we're past that now. Uh, that's out of the news cycle uh, until, of course, the next time it happens, maybe. Uh, but that was the first, that bloodbath comment was the first, uh, I think, real big, huge backbone I saw the media sort of wield in response to these these calls for violence. Uh, because, you know, I, I think uh, Jen Psaki did a, a great piece on it where she's like, oh, you want context? Okay. And she went over January 6th and she went over all of the um, political violence that's happened since then and all the calls for political violence uh, that have happened. And, I, you know, she left out all the stuff where, there are currently open and ongoing investigations by Jack Smith that were used as evidence in the Mar-a-Lago case to try to keep the witness lists from being released. Like, there's so much of this and so many threats. I don't understand. I'm with you. I do, there should be far more coverage of this. But, you know, Trump did get a teeny tiny win in yeah. Fulton County this past week. I can't believe all of the things that have happened this week. That <laughs> There's a lot going now. This <laughs> Trump's win, of course, didn't have to be delayed because most people on the you know <laughs> other side still remain sane and aren't engaging in threats and acts of violence. But Judge McAfee threw out six charges in the broad Fulton County. Not not these weren't all Trump, but threw out six of the Fulton County charges. Three of those were for Donald Trump bringing his grand total of 91 down to 88. So don't, you know, let's not say, oh, everything's, you know, out of the woods and this is not a big deal. He's still facing 88 felony counts. Now, here's the breakdown of the six that have been dismissed. Uh, the first is count two, which is against Giuliani, Eastman, and Smith, specifically for soliciting a public officer to violate their oath on December 3rd when they met at the Georgia State Capitol. Count five, which is against Trump, for soliciting a public officer to violate their oath on a December 7th, 2020, uh, in a call to House Speaker David Ralston. Count six, against Giuliani and Smith, for soliciting a public officer to violate their oath in a December 10th meeting with Georgia House members. Count 23, against Giuliani, Smith, and Sheely, for soliciting a public officer to violate their oath in a December 30th meeting. So much, so much crime here, right? I mean, these are all different dates. They're all you know, a December 30th meeting with the Georgia Senate Judiciary Committee, count 28 against Trump and Meadows for soliciting an officer to violate their oath in the January 2nd call with Raffensperger. And finally, count 38 against Trump soliciting an officer to violate their oath when he sent his September 17th, 2021 letter to Raffensperger. Now, the theme across all of these dismissed charges is that the counts that have to do with soliciting officers to violate their oaths of office uh, comes with one specific problem. That problem is that the charges, in those charges, the DA doesn't specify what part of their oath they were pushed to violate or how that would violate either the Georgia state constitution on the one hand or the U.S. constitution on the other. Now, what he said is like, look, you can, this doesn't mean they're gone forever. The, you know, Fulton County can turn around and recharge them. They can charge them separately. But I think there are a lot of reasons involving, you know, one, just the delay in bringing them again. Is that something that you want to do? Is bringing it separately, opening up a whole can of worms of a second trial that you don't want to confuse things? Or do you just let the, you know, go with your 88, right? And then, you know, whatever subset is there for against Trump in Georgia, but, you know, you've still got things against Meadows. You still have charges against Giuliani and Smith and Chile. So it's not like you suddenly have any defendants that are going to walk free, right? No, They've it's still 10. Got- I, think, I think Meadows got the luckiest. He got knocked down to one. 
uh, count. So his uh, – because he had two counts and this is uh, takes him down to one. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, the other thing too is that all of these are also overt acts as part of the racketeering charge and they are all remaining as overt acts. They aren't stricken as overt acts. Um, so that's good too. And I think kind of what this boils down to, at least from what I'm understanding from the great reporters on the ground, Anthony Kreese and Anna Bauer and uh, Tamara Hallerman, uh, especially all this reporting from the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, is that Georgia, like in the federal system, if some of your charges aren't clear and the defendant doesn't know how to defend themselves, they file what's called a bill of particulars. And that gives the DOJ time to come in and say, oh, here's we're here. We'll we'll expand on it for you here. But Georgia doesn't have that kind of mechanism. So you actually have to go back to the grand jury and get a superseding indictment if you want to file the charges. At least that's kind of my um, my understanding of of why um, these were just thrown out without any other kind of consideration. It's just the way that it's done. And those experts, including um, the law professor, Anthony Cree, says that this was proper because without these explanations, these charges, if they're convicted for them, could be tossed out afterwards. And you would be past double jeopardy after a jury is impaneled in the trial. So you wouldn't be able to bring them again. So he's actually saying it's good that this is coming up before double jeopardy would attach. She can go and get these again, uh, or she can move forward, like you said, without these charges, because they don't come out of the overt acts that uh, underpin the RICO charge, which is the main charge in this case. Right. And again, the I think the biggest, biggest thing at the end of the day is what you let off with there, that they get to include all of these events as overt acts. So even if they're not independent charges, all of these things will be there as evidence. They will be there for, again, because Fulton County, we're all going to get to watch it instead of like relying on somebody to run out of the courthouse and give us an update <laughs> because the federal courthouses are sealed. But, uh, you know, th- they will... They are compelling pieces of data and events, and we'll get to see them as part of uh, Fulton County's prosecution. Yep. All right. We have a little more news to get to, including some breaking news, but we have to take a quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Here's our last batch of new patrons to thank. Howard MHC, John, Daniela Bella, graduated from 25th grade. Keep up the good work. Sally and Carrie, more cowbell, please. Excellent. Thank you very much. I also love more cowbell. So here's the breaking news. And of course, we record this a day and a half or two before it comes out. So it's not breaking for you anymore. But I want to read this to you. Uh, Pete, let me see if I can find this tweet here from Steve Vladek, of course, our con law, uh, amazing expert, author of the book Shadow Docket. Chief Justice John Roberts, acting alone, has turned away Peter Navarro's emergency request to block his (laughs) having to report to federal prison tomorrow. (laughs) There we go. I thought you were going to go with something else. This is a complete, this is a surprise. This is one of those pleasant surprises. Go to jail. Do not, do not, you landed on that corner spot on the Monopoly board, go directly to jail. <laughs> When's your birthday, Do not Pete? pass go. Do not. My birthday was was March seventh. This is a oh. late birthday present. Yeah, happy. So. Yeah, we're close. Happy late birthday, my friend. Yeah, thank you. That's great. So we can. So we'll, as we'll you bring back in the bonus episode, we'll we'll bring back our <laughs> Pete Navarro's first trip to, to the FCI Miami's commissary. <laughs> So uh, gotta give me a sock and some of them Oreos. Yeah, get a sock full of Oreos <laughs> gotta, gotta and protect some, myself. And some Roger Stone did nothing wrong pants on. Them. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was such a fun segment that we did on the last bonus episode, by the way. Uh, but now we can say, as you are listening to this on Wednesday, that Pete Navarro is in fact spending his first full day. In well, prison. unless that bird decides to fly. Oh, <laughs> <And> right. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, do you, does he make know a, anybody Make a that new has life for himself in Indonesia. So someplace, <laughs> what, know? where don't they, Nicaragua, Cuba, where don't does, they have, that's the problem with Petey. All the places that don't have extradition treaties, I think Navarro's bad mouth at some point in time. Yeah, so. but he also, it's, his, it's a none conundrum. Of his, none of his friends have money, so... <laughs> As we've learned from Rudy Giuliani, broke. Donald Trump, broke. Uh, So anyway, super, super funny. Uh, And also, again, I understand the law is no laughing matter. And he did 
uh, violate the law uh, when well, he when it, com- when it comes to Pete Navarro, it's a little bit of a laughing matter. But yeah. I am celebrating um, uh, justice. That's what I'm celebrating right now. Mm. And that makes me there giddy. you go. All right. There you go. Let's talk about what's happening in the Michigan Attorney General's case against fraudulent electors in her state. She was, by the way, the first to indict fraudulent electors. Um, It's getting wild over there. Oakland County Circuit Court Judge Jeffrey Mattis issued a bench warrant for a lawyer, Stephanie Lambert, granting a request from the prosecution after she repeatedly failed to provide fingerprints and DNA samples as required by law. Lambert did not appear at the March 7th show cause hearing. Another had, birthday present. Another, another birthday present. <laughs> another birthday present. <laughs> the bench warrant for her and Pete Navarro. Okay. And the poke, Pete and the poke. Uh, so she, she didn't show up to that hearing and she had 24 hours to turn herself in. She did not. Then on March 14th, a week later, Detroit News reported that Lambert is now being accused of mishandling documents in that federal court case, in a federal court case, a different one. This week, attorneys for the Dominion Voting Systems said Lambert used records that were supposed to remain concealed to support her efforts to fight her bench warrant in Oakland County Circuit Court. That's all discovery under protective order. Dominion sued Patrick Byrne, the former Overstock CEO, in August of 2021 for spreading conspiracy theories about them after the 2020 election. And Lambert notified the court in D.C. that she's going to serve as Byrne's lawyer as of Tuesday, (laughs) five days after there was a bench warrant issued for her arrest because she didn't show up for that hearing. Last Friday, Lambert filed an emergency motion to halt her proceedings in Oakland County, where her felony charges are pending. The motion included new allegations against Dominion, an affidavit from Barry County Sheriff Dar Leaf, and about 48 pages of what appeared to be internal emails among Dominion employees. And this past Monday, a Twitter account under Sheriff Dar Leaf's name released another 2,000 emails from Dominion, that from that lawsuit, that should be protected discovery. So all kinds of shenanigans going on with Stephanie Lambert. Uh, how she still has a law license, I don't know. Well, actually, I do know because of what the story you're about to tell about Jeffrey Clark and how long it takes to get a disbarment <laughs> in this country. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and this is crazy, right? Because I mean, one thing, Patrick Byrne is a goofball. I mean, he, you know, of of overstock fame and was chumming around with Maria Butina and gave her, you know, money to make sure she landed on her feet back in Russia, where she promptly went out and hounded uh, Alexei Navalny in solitary confinement, yelling at him about how good he had it compared to if he had been in an American jail and then runs for the Duma, the 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 parliament in Russia and wins all thanks in part to Patrick Burns bankrolling of her uh, back in the motherland. But what's <laughs> some of these things I'm like, why Darleaf? That sounds familiar. Darleaf. You know why that sounds familiar? Because he has teamed up. This is a story back in 2022 in July, teamed up with the Trump camp lawyer. This is a Reuters report teamed up with a Trump camp lawyer to chase the former president's outlandish rigged election theories, a member of a radical group of constitutional sheriffs. He's now under investigation himself. So this is, you hear sheriff, and you're like, oh, wow, well, it sounds like some, no, 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 no. This is a, you know, allegedly crazy, kooky, you know, far right constitutional sheriff above and outside of the law that uh, Stephanie Lambert is teaming up with to pursue justice. It's just going to end horribly for all of them, but not quickly enough. Nope. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, <laughs> and speaking of, you know, kind of the feckless and people who don't have money that you just mentioned, let's talk about Rudy a little bit. The official committee of unsecured creditors, that's a real group and a real thing. And on Friday, they filed a motion in bankruptcy court to force Rudy to sell his $3.5 million Florida condo to help pay off some of his debts. The motion found that the Palm Beach condo is a non-exempt asset, meaning Giuliani can't keep it and has, quote, no credible argument that he is entitled to live there, unquote. (laughs) Creditors are also asking the court to make Giuliani get homeowner's insurance for his Florida condo and his New York City apartment, saying his failure to do so is putting his estate at risk. Yeah, like you could burn it down. Yeah, (laughs) or, you know, the the rest of the condo complex with it, right, or the apartment building. When he filed for bankruptcy in December, Giuliani reported assets between one and ten million dollars, as well as between one hundred to five hundred million dollars in estimated liabilities in his bankruptcy filing. He 
He also owes more than $130,000 in attorney fees from the defamation case. So, you know, none of this is Rudy's limited. You know, he does, in fact, appear to have more than two turntables and a microphone. But, uh, you know, of these two, his primary residence, he claims, is his New York city apartment. And that's why, you know, this filing, they're like, look, he's not entitled to live in this Palm Beach condo. That is not his primary residence. And, uh, you know, we want to attach to it. And so we'll see. You know. Yeah. And the reason we never heard about this Florida condo is because he never t- said anything about it, even though he was required to by the judge uh, up in the Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss case. That was one of the reasons he got that uh, uh, summary judgment against him and um, sanctions and $148 million uh, award for Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss because he refused to disclose how much money it was worth and where all of his assets were. We just heard through the news that he was trying to put up his New York uh, condo, and now we hear in bankruptcy court that he's got a $3.5 million condo down in Florida. So bummer for him, uh, but a little bit of good news for Jeffrey Clark. It mm-hmm. looks like the D.C. Court of Appeals has concluded that uh, Jeffrey Clark was subject to D.C. bar rules while serving at the DOJ. So he he is, you know, he can be disbarred, but he can assert the Fifth Amendment, to refuse to respond Mm. to some document requests in the disbarment Mm. proceedings. I've never never really seen Fifth Amendment apply to Deuce's take home to documents. But here, the D.C. court ruled that he doesn't have to hand over those documents because of the Fifth Amendment. So I don't think that's going to save his law license, but... The, the 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 man who has been reduced to only a derisive grunt for me gets a derisive grunt. I just, uh, you know, uh. fine. I, it, it, the interesting thing is that, yes, in fact, he is in a predicament where these documents might well inculpate him in criminal matters. So, you know, that's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. Like, no, I don't want to turn these over in my uh, bar um, proceedings because they might tend to... Uh, make me guilty in a criminal context. So, yeah, And I imagine it, that pleading the fifth could draw negative inference in a bar I would proceeding. Hope. I would I think would, so. It, and if it doesn't, what the hell are we doing? What right. DC bar, what do you, if you <laughs> right. can't draw a negative inference for like, I'm not going to give you this in this, you know, this isn't even a civil proceeding is per, per professional ethical license licensure licensure. What, what you have to do it to get your bar license. Um, if, if, you cannot draw a negative inference from that. I don't know what the hell the purpose is. I, it just, it, it is surprising to me that it has taken this long. It seems to be on the right path. It is not, for example, uh, it is much better off than whatever is going on with Sydney Powell down in Texas. And yeah, I still haven't seen a refiling. Process there. I have not seen a refiling. God knows what the Kraken is doing, but uh, all her little, you know, Stephanie Lambert, Gentilla protégés, are uh, not doing particularly well, but who knows? We'll see what happens with Jeffrey Clark. It's a, hopefully just grinding slowly and quite small. We'll see. Hopefully. Yeah. And and maybe, you know, I think most of these folks are going to end up in prison. So that that doesn't look good, you know, on the Bar Association website. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember there being a big Jeffrey Clark warning yellow exclamation point sign next to his uh, profile on the California Bar uh, no, that was Eastman, excuse me, California Bar website saying, warning, 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 um, this guy's been indicted. <laughs> so yeah. ugh, the standing can't be good, uh, but we still haven't heard on Rudy's disbarment. It's been forever. Those proceedings are finished. We're waiting on Eastman, and now Clark can plead the fifth by not handing over documents, apparently. So it's just you thought that the regular criminal justice process was slow. The disbarment one seems to be a lot slower, so we'll keep you posted. All right, that's the show. Again, congratulations, Pete Navarro. You get to report to prison yesterday. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, tune in, patrons, and become a patron if you're not, to hear us on this bonus episode pulling up the Bureau of Prisons website to check on inmate Navarro and see what information we can get uh, from his file. Yep, and we do have a little bit of inside information uh, from the, the Bureau of Prisons that we'll talk about, along with, uh, you know, we'll swear about Manafort uh, being brought back onto the campaign of an American president. Oh, my president. God. Cannot believe it. That's, well, actually, um, I can't believe it. That's Yeah, well, it just kind of goes to show how much they don't care. He doesn't care anymore. You know, back then, when they found out that he was paid, 
um, by Yanukovych, Trump was like, well, we got to fire him. And that's not the case anymore. It just doesn't matter anymore. When he was nope. told, when he was advised, probably shouldn't fire Mueller, he listened. When yeah, he was told, I'm uh, sure you got- can't put Jeffrey Clark in as attorney general, or we're all going to resign, he listened. We aren't going to get those concessions in a second Trump term. Not at all. And you got to ask, I mean, the first time around, they brought in Manafort to like uh, corral delegate votes at the convention. He's got the con- the nomination sewn up. So what on earth does he need Manafort for? Oh, Other than, I, I know. What, you, Ukraine connections? He Russia needs Russia to win this election. That's what, <sighs> that's what this is for. But I mean, it, it may or may not have worked last time when he gave all that polling data to a Russian intelligence person, Konstantin Kalimnik. Not alleged, by the way. I know that the Washington Post says he's allegedly got ties to Russia. No, he is, by the U.S. Treasury, a Russian asset. So a <laughs> um, little bit uh, soft on the words there with regard to Yeah, and like, you know, when you read reporters, you're going to, yeah, when you're going to do something, pull up the statement of facts, pull up what people actually plead guilty to, and, and you don't need to clear your throat with these words like alleged or so-called or, you know, apparently or according to some. You can just look and see what they said they did or what judges determined that they did and just call a spade a spade and, you know, in contact with a Russian aid, period, passing polling data to a Russian agent, period. There, you don't need to soften the blow. You're not, your in attorneys need to dial it back states. a little bit because you're, yes, you're, you're on firm legal footing to assert it as fact because it is a fact and, and stop with the, this, this is why we're at where we're at. But anyway, yeah, well, polling data in four swing states that Trump won by less than a fewer than 88,000 votes, which handed him the 2016 election. Coincidence? Mm. Let's watch. Uh, you probably know better than me and can't say anything, but we'll talk about it on Thursday mm. during the bonus episode. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.